as a bank of Harlem. Pee Wee was driving the Rolls Royces as a teenager. So what would make one of the top point guards in the nation decline a contract from the Chicago Bulls? This is Behind the Jersey, episode four. Richard Pee Wee Kirkland. Hit that subscribe button. Let's lock in, my boys. Bow. What up, YouTube? It's your boy, Fan Goo. The fan dude Vanessa, bet MGM Flexer, turn them noties on, subscribe to the channel. Let's lock in, my boys. Back with another one. Today we going to Harlem. Yes, Harlem, USA, Harlem World, the home of Mason Betha, Killer Cam, Mo Bamba. Yes, Harlem World. Today we bringing you one of the biggest OGs from Harlem, one of the early pioneers of street basketball culture in New York City, Richard Kirkland, aka Pee Wee Kirkland. Yes, so real quick, like and subscribe, gang. I appreciate all the love, but we not done. Keep fessing me up. I'ma drop more videos keep smashing the like button keep smashing the subscribe button and without further ado let's get to it bow now richard peewee kirkland born may 6 1945 in harlem new york peewee grew up on the east side of harlem on 116th street with his sister and two brothers the kirkland family struggled financially one of his earlier memories was waking up in the morning shaking the cereal box around so the roaches would go to the bottom but peewee didn't like the feeling of being broke so from a young age he jumped off the porch and began living a fast life yes First he started selling newspapers, but eventually he would meet some older kids and they began stealing cars and coming up with schemes to rob jewelry stores. Yes, it's alleged that Pee Wee and his crew would steal jewelry and bring it to the Italian mob and the Italian mob would hit Pee Wee and his homies off with work. Pee Wee was 14 years old with six figures in his pocket and he was known more as a middleman when it came to the drug game. Yes, see Pee Wee was never involved with any hand-to-hand -hand transactions and he also never consumed any drugs around the time when everybody was getting high it's reported that Pee Wee would give loans to struggling small businesses when he was only a teenager yes around this time Pee Wee also started casually playing basketball at the age of 14 Pee Wee scored 70 points in a community center game and he would become known as a scoring machine around Harlem at six foot one Pee Wee had lightning quick agility they compared him to his rival at the time tiny Archibald yes so Pee Wee was naturally gifted at the game of basketball and his IQ allowed him to see the plays before it happened he would go on to play at Manhattan's Charles Evans Hughes High School where he would become an all-city point guard Pee Wee started his high school career off slow only averaging 16 points a game but one day an old head will pull him to the side and challenge Pee Wee to fess it up, challenge Pee Wee to take it to the next level. So that's what Pee Wee did. He started fessing it up, started scoring 50 points a game, 60 points a game, but Pee Wee still was halfway in and halfway out. He wasn't all the way focused on organized basketball. Pee Wee still loved street basketball and he still loved making money. Around this time, Pee Wee had been recruited by the basketball legend Bob McCullough and Bob was now the commissioner of the Rucker Park League in Harlem, New York. Yes, so Bob had Pee Wee playing on a team with Willis Reed, who would eventually become an MVP and a two-time NBA champion. With the love and success, nobody could tell Pee Wee nothing around Harlem. He was definitely the man, and Pee Wee's high school coach didn't really care for Pee Wee. He made no effort to help Pee Wee land a scholarship at a big-time college program. So after high school, Pee Wee would attend a community college in North Carolina where he averaged 41 points per game. From there, he transferred to Norfolk State in Virginia where he played alongside the legendary Bob Dandridge who was from Richmond, Virginia and would eventually become a two-time NBA champion with the Milwaukee Bucks. So in 1968, they both started fessing it up. Pee Wee and Dandridge, they led Norfolk State to an impressive 25-2 record. The next year, they went 20 one and four and they realized it was time to go to the a it was time to declare for the draft so that's what they did 
Dandridge was drafted in the fourth round, and Pee Wee went in the 13th round to the Chicago Bulls. But Pee Wee was still tied into the streets, and he was making way more money in the streets than he ever could make in the NBA. So he decided to decline his contract, and he went back to Harlem and started fessing it up even more. Real quick, I want to play a clip from Tax Stone's podcast, Tax Season. In this clip, he breaks down why he declined the NBA contract and why he went back to Harlem and what the vibes were like. So tune in. We're going to keep fessing it up, and we'll be right back. Bow. Yo, you know it. what I wanted to ask you? How much, how, much did the, how much did the Chicago Bulls offer you for you to turn them down? It was, it was uh, $40,000. Because they didn't pay that. It, it was more than they, this was in the 1970s. Yeah, no, it was before 70s. 70s, 60s. 60s? Yeah, oh. it was more than they gave most people. But the reality was, it. I mean, it wasn't compared to the money that I was dealing with at the time. It was like, what? What was the comparison to, to the money you was dealing with? That was not money. That was gambling money. You know what I mean? <laughs> you know, but it wasn't. See, it wasn't the money back then. Back then. Back then. They it, they said the. You know, well, I know from being around you and, uh, you know what I mean, certain people, y'all had a lot of pickup games in Rucker. What was the games, what was the gambling amounts and yeah, how I did mean, they I go? Was playing one-on-one games for 10,000 hours, you know what I mean? And mm-hmm. that's 10,000 hours, my bet, and everybody else was betting with And this bet. is in the 1960s, $10,000 yeah. back then was way different. Yeah, it was way different. Now, we were reading uh, the papers the other day uh, with the Final Times that said PB Kirkland was Net worth was forty million, forty million. His holdings was something else, and all you know what I mean. But they, that's what they knew about. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? That's what they knew about. That's what take they knew that, about. Take so, that. but back then, and and then it's the other thing. Back then, it was a money game. Mm-hmm. That been changed, and that's another thing I used to tell you. See, the game then with young people today, they're in a game that, even though. Once you grow in your life and you realize it's the wrong thing to do, period, because ain't nobody dying in the game but the people in your community. Yeah. Once you realize that part of it, the other shocking thing is, what are you in this game for? How many people can you name in that game that really made money in the game? Because it was, it, the game had changed. It was not a money game no more. So as you hear from the clip, Pee Wee was making too much money and fessing it up like never before. When Pee Wee came back to Harlem, he was known as a hood hero. Many families depended on Pee Wee. If you were short on money, Pee Wee would help you. He paid for college tuitions, helped community centers, fed people who didn't have food. Pee Wee was known as the Bank of Harlem, and this also included a drug empire. The local hustlers would use Pee Wee's money to get more product on the street. Pee Wee never had to touch any work. He had guys bringing him money back at a rapid rate. During this time, it's alleged that he had endless exotic cars from Ferraris, Mercedes Benzes, Rolls Royces, Mink Furs, all kinds of jewelry, a mansion in Long Island. Yes, it's alleged his net worth climbed up to 30 Three million dollars might have been higher. I don't know, but Pee Wee was known as a real life Robin Hood, and everyone in Harlem loved Pee Wee. But little did Pee Wee know it would all come crashing down. In 1971, the feds would strike down on Pee Wee, and Pee Wee was hit with conspiracy to sell narcotics, which landed Pee Wee in a federal penitentiary in Lewisburg, Pennsylvania. While incarcerated, Kirkland did play in several semi-pro prison leagues. It's reported that he was scoring 100 points a game in some of these prison leagues. He was released in 1975, and he was living on the West Coast for a while, where allegedly he was running a car dealership and playing in several Los Angeles Lakers charity basketball games. But around 1981, Pee Wee was arrested again for tax evasion. From 1981 to 1988, he was housed at a federal prison in Latuna, Texas. Yes, this is a prison that housed the Mexican mafia, the Mexican cartel, one of the craziest correctional facilities in the country. So real quick, I want to play another clip from the Tax Season podcast with Pee Wee, where he talks about his time incarcerated and what the vibes were like and the lessons that he learned. So let's tune in and we'll be right back. Bow! Pee Wee is responsible for a lot. For anybody that know me in high school and going through my teenage years, Pee Wee was the reason that we had 17 furs on. You know, 
Pee Wee had us in an abundance of furs before this mink fur, like this whole fur epidemic that's going on in New York City with all the rappers wearing all the furs. We had furs in abundance. And this is 2004, 2005. This is when R. Kelly was coming out with mink jerseys. We was wearing mink jerseys. The first time I ever met the Clips, Pusha T, and Malice was through Pee Wee. You know what I mean? The first people, the, the dudes that said, um, you know, legend in the game, like I'm Pee Wee Kirkland. The first dudes to talk about him, like, you know, dudes that hip hop that glorified him because of his actions and what he stood for. Like, well, Pee Wee is one of the only dudes in Harlem that, that stood up. Yeah, see, one, and, 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 and see, the thing about it, and because of that, I mean, when you say stood up, you talk about, yeah, I mean, they know I'm going to lecture chair at the time doing the boogaloo, doing a dance. Mm -hmm. That's how committed I was to the game. You understand what I'm saying? Death before dishonor. And that meant everything in the world to me because the game did. But then later on in life, I started hearing them voices of people who was in my head like I was in Tech's head. Mm -hmm. Then all of a sudden I started saying, you know what? When do you win this here? And then that's when I figured out you don't win. And you know why you don't win? Because I got guys right now that I used to associate with. I mean, young guys in the game that I love to death. I mean, we stood, I mean, I was, my first case, I was the guy who was the only person who got busted. Nobody else got busted. How many years did you do? 11 years. All together. And then at, at, uh, the last time, remember they indicted my mother for tax yeah, evasion? Yeah, like 17 or some shit. The same case they gave Al Capone, mm -hmm. network tax case, they only gave it to Al Capone and me. So they indicted her, two grand jurors. They couldn't come up with evidence. So they said, you know what? What we're going to do is we're going to, I say, no, you're not going to do nothing. Cause For y'all that don't understand what Pee Wee case was, Pee Wee had tax evasion. Yeah, but it wasn't a regular tax evasion. It mm -hmm. was a net worth tax case. They only gave it to me and Al Capone mm -hmm. because that's when they, they don't have, I'm going to have a tax case. I have a job. <laughs> See what I'm saying? I'm going to owe you taxes. For what? Yeah. But they gave the net worth tax case, and that's what they did with me. And as a result, I'm giving me that case. You know, with nobody gone, I'm not going to take a chance to see Mom Dukes go to prison. That's how, you know, my lawyers was the same lawyers got here at mm -hmm. uh, Shargell and them. And I told him, I said, look, here, I understand what you're saying, Shargell, but do you want to be the person looking in my face if what you're telling me go wrong? And then he looked at me and said, I understand what you're saying, Pee And he called a day and I just told him I plead guilty. He said, you can't plead guilty, Pee because you're pleading to 11 account indictment, which is 55 years. I said, you call the DA. Let me years. do the 55 years. And that's why I said God, because the DA got on the phone, assistant DA, and she said on the phone with him on one end, well, you know what we're going to do? If he pleads guilty, he's got to plead guilty to 10 years. I mean, I almost fell out of my chair. 10 years. I'm ready to do 10 you years. You almost pulled the shuck right. He almost you know faded that? in the chair. That's right. Y'all laughing years. at Shug. What? We almost did the same thing. Because I'm so, I'm like committed to the 55, because I don't want to see my mother do five days. Mm -hmm. And then... You know, and then once they agreed, what I did was when she got phone, I said, call her back and tell her to put on the calendar. Because, you know, I know the law. Mm -hmm. See, once you put on the calendar, they can't change it. And went to Vegas, and then I found out they was trying to fire after that. <laughs> when they found out the mistakes she had made. So I yeah. just did that 10 years. And after that there, like I said, I I mean, the you know, it did. The you had Pee Wee, Pee Wee talking about 10 years. Like, that shit is three weeks. No, <laughs> because guess what? When I went to the tape, because I know how they saw me and I know they know who, why they, how they want bad. They want to break me. So what I did was I said, don't call me to go to nobody's, uh, parole, mm -hmm. no parole. I'm not going to pro board. Tell the pro board. I hit me. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? I'm going to hit me. I'm doing the time. Now, when it came time to go halfway, I was not going to nobody's house, but my house, because that's how I saw it. I said, if you keep me a day longer, then I'm suing you. But if you let me go the day before we've good. And that's how I want to do it. But mm -hmm. now I knew when I did that, that I did, I did it more for the life ahead of me because I didn't want to see young people go through what so many young people around me was going through because everybody's not ready for that type of life. Prison life is not for every kid. So as you hear from the clip, Pee Wee utilized his time while he was locked up and he elevated his mind and elevated the way he looked at life. 
Once Pee Wee was released, he hit the ground running and became a rehabilitated changed man. He began going to local churches, working with community programs to assist various kids that were going down the wrong path. Pee Wee even made his acting debut in the classic basketball movie Above the Rim, where Pee Wee plays the role of a Georgetown recruit. He also appeared in the 2018 comedy Uncle Drew. While Pee Wee never had a chance to play in the NBA, Pee Wee still had a very successful career as a motivational speaker and all around life coach. Pee Wee continues to work with kids from all backgrounds and shares his stories. So that's it for today. If y'all got more Pee Wee facts, please comment below. This dude's like a ninja, you know what I'm saying? It was hard to find clips. It was hard to find facts on him. So if y'all got something, comment below. Uh, you know, tap in with me. Shout out my boy Take Notes TV. Y'all know who it is. Keep liking, keep subscribing. Y'all know who it is. It's your boy Fangoon. Bow.